Down, please. Thank you. So, welcome to uh, Bro so Bro welcome to Bronx Street Board 10's public hearing on the ULIP application. After this public hearing, we are going to have a full board meeting. So, you're more than welcome to uh, stick around for that. Before we begin, as we begin every meeting, I'm going to ask everyone to please stand, face the flag, and the pledge of allegiance. Flags are over here. Right here. Right here. Right here. Right here. After the flag, folks. And listen, if anybody says they can't hear, this is the sound system we have. If you can't hear, keep your mouth shut and maybe you'll hear better. Okay? Fine. I pledge allegiance. After the Pledge of Allegiance, I'm going to ask everyone to please observe a moment of silence. Uh, first of all, I want us all to remember the victims of the terrorist attack against our fellow citizens in Buffalo. And no matter how impassioned or uh, debatable our opinions are, violence and hatred are never the answer for that. There's always more that unites us than divides us. So remember the people who died there, Roberta Drury, Marcus Morrison, Andre McNeil, Aaron Salter, Geraldine Talley, Celestine Cheney, Hayward Patterson, Catherine Massey, Pearl Young, and Ruth Winfield. I also want you to remember the victims of random gun violence in our borough, particularly 11-year-old Kira Tay, who essentially lost her life this week as well. And finally, closer to home for all of us, our longtime board member Jim McQuaid passed away last week at the age of 75. Recently, Jim was honored by Borough President Gibson a day before he died for his years of service to the community board. And those years of service paled in comparison to his years of support for the Throgs Neck community. Throgs Neck is today because of Jim's contributions. So we'll begin with the pledge, and then I shall have a moment of silence, please. Okay, so tonight's agenda for the public hearing. Okay, the agenda just came. Uh, the agenda tonight was going to be we're going to have a pre we're going to have the presentation from uh, the applicants. Uh, we're still waiting for some technical issues, so we are going to begin with a statement by uh, our Councilwoman Marjorie Velasquez. Then uh, we'll have some public uh, participation and then they'll do the presentation and we'll close with more public participation. I'm going to remind everyone again, personal tax against a board member, staff member, member of the public, and elected officials and representatives will result in, the indiv in an individual being asked to leave the meeting and could result in the meeting's closure. Outbursts from the public after the public speaking portion of the meeting has been closed will result in the individuals being asked to leave the meeting. If outbursts or attacks continue, this will be considered disturbing the peace. Authorities shall be summoned. We do have some members of the 45th Precinct here tonight in the back as well. All speakers must address the board members with concerns. These are the board members. If you're coming up here for public speaking, you address these people. I'm glad that everybody's here, but this is not a show for everybody to just uh, make noise and go on from there. So if you have anything to say, it's addressed to the board members. And no solicitation, no solicitation or electioneering. So this is the public hearing on Euler C220007 MX CEQR slash D slash 22 DCP 015X. So I'm gonna uh, before we begin, I'm gonna read a statement from our council member who could not be here tonight. <laughs> Folks, what did I just say like five seconds ago? Okay, this is a statement from, this is a statement from uh, New York City Council Member Marjorie Velasquez on the Bronx Community Board 10 vote on Bruckner rezoning. Since the community first heard about the rezoning and throughout the many presentations that have been given, I have said that I do not support the Bruckner Boulevard rezoning proposal. Any new development in this community needs to address existing inequities before I would be able to support them. Due to the current lack of existing infrastructure, including acceptable school space, parking, public transportation, and other needs, 
I cannot support any project that doesn't include remedies for these, for, for these issues. My intention this evening was to attend the community board meeting and continue to listen to the community's stance on the matter of the Brooklyn development. Unfortunately, there have been a number of threats made against me on several community forums out of concern for the well-being of my fellow community members and to avoid the distraction of, the, of those intent on division. I'm choosing to submit this written testimony. I've always promoted community engagement, whether it's hosting hearings at the city council, opening our district up to partic participatory budgeting for the first time, holding community meetings on the city's planned homeless shelters, and attending multiple meetings regarding this specific project. I want the community to be able to engage and vote how they believe without the threats of violence espoused by others regarding my presence. I will reiterate that I do not support this proposal and I will not tolerate the divisive rhetoric of those interested in, severing, in, in serving themselves rather than the community. We will continue to work to bring our community forward. Back on the speaker's uh, list, please. All right, so as, as I said before, we're gonna start with some public, uh, public participation, then we'll have a presentation, then we'll come back. Our first public speaker is Michael Chumlowski. Very good. <laughs> Following Michael will be William Sowick and then Joseph De Tiberius. Everyone's got three minutes. And address the board. To the board, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. I'm going to read from a letter that I sent to Chairman Daniel Garodnik of the New York City Department of Student Planning back on March 30th. Dear Chairman Garodnik, uh, I'm a current resident of the Bronx, having lived in what is often considered the water burial of the South community for the past 14 years. Yesterday, Tuesday, 29 March of 2022, I reviewed a portion of the New York City Department of City Planning public review session that took place on Monday, the 28th of March, and which was posted in full at the department's YouTube channel. The portion I viewed, timestamp 155.30 through 210.17, dealt with the proposed Rutger Boulevard upzoning and its associated Tribeck Associates LLC real estate development project. This letter is to inform you that there were several misrepresentations and ambiguities in those 15 minutes of discussion, and I wish to correct the record. Below are the timestamps in which the erroneous questionable statements were made with the latter enclosed in quotation marks. I'll just give you one. 156.40, Bruckner Boulevard is a wide street. That's the quote. Bruckner Boulevard is a divided roadway cut evenly in half by the Bruckner Expressway, Interstate 95. Each half serves as a de facto service road to the expressway consisting of two lanes with curbside parking and requisite bus stops in both directions of travel. Each half of this quote unquote wide street is narrow enough such that the eastbound half limits the size of equipment utilized by our local firehouse engine 89, ladder 50, the station being located between Tremont and Edison Avenue. Drivers of the fire trucks barely have enough room to make the turn out of and into the firehouse. Care must be exercised when doing so. There are eight other points that I took exception to, okay? In addition to the presentation that day, nothing was said about infrastructure. Based on what I heard, which came directly from, from Trotsneck Associates, LLC. In my opinion, you cannot believe anything that comes out of that, that organization, okay? I ask Trotsneck <laughs> that we vote to deny the upzoning to the, to the City Planning Commission and to squash this abomination of a project that Trotsneck Associates is looking to ram down the community's throat. Thank you. After we have I got Joseph De Tiberius and then Judy Passarelli. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is William Sawicki. Uh, my wife and I have lived in Brodsnick for over 50 years, and we are currently very happy with the existing zoning that exists right now. We don't feel, okay, that we have to have this up zoning. We have plenty of shopping. 
We have plenty, okay, of all the facilities that we need, okay? And one big thing, okay, as far as diversification, our neighborhood is so diverse these days, okay, and we feel, okay, that Throckneck should stay the way it is, okay, and we really are against this upzoning. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Wiki. I apologize for mispronouncing your name. Joseph D. Tiberius, and then Judy Passarelli, and then Lee Agavino. Mixed-use development like this one proposed by developers will be permanently staffed 
by an estimated 12 to 14 goods and service workers, and will also have approximately 339 new units, of which 94 of those units will be affordable housing in accordance with the mandatory inclusive housing program. These jobs are typically filled by local members of the community, and because of this commitment, will pay family sustaining wages, which help bring working families into middle class. These apartments are needed for working people in the Bronx. This commitment to good, prevailing wage jobs will give opportunity for upward mobility, security, and dignity to working class families. For these reasons, we are in full support of this project. We have full confidence that Thrive Next Associates LLC will be a, reason, a responsible employer and presence in the community. For these reasons, we respectfully urge you to approve this rezoning. showing any new sewer systems installed or any new water delivery systems. There will be no slides showing any increase to emergency services, FDNY, NYPD, sanitation. There will be no slides to show that. And I, it, these projects cannot be uh, constructed without these support services. And these support services are, are usually uh, planned for 10 years out in a capital plan, in the city's capital plan. Having said that, um, also, I, uh, I wanted to impress upon you that uh, this, uh, this project will change the landscape of the uh, neighborhood. Uh, the neighborhood is you know, low density, single family, two family homes, and this is the beginning of, of, a, of a, you know, larger, a larger movement. And uh, I also wanted to say that um, you know, again, I, I don't want to interject my emotion into it. I, I just want to stick to the facts, and the facts are that there is no infrastructure to support this. this their presentation will, will show it. I don't have to show it because their presentation won't show it. <laughs> Having said that, I would appreciate uh, your consideration to vote, uh, you know, according to your hearts. And in the absence of uh, Councilperson uh, Marjorie Velasquez being here, I would also like to, for the folks that are recording this for the record, uh, ask uh, our council member to uh, invoke council member deference on this issue uh, so that it can be finalized and it can be ended. So I appreciate your time and uh, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. We've got uh, Mary Lou Moody, and then Aiden Munasar, and then we're going to go to the presentation. Hi, my name is Michael Cass, and I've been doing a lot of listening. I've attended nearly every meeting on this, so I've heard a lot of what folks have had to say about this housing proposal. What I haven't heard is what we're going to do about our housing crisis. This is what it all boils down to. We have a housing crisis because not enough homes are being built, resulting in increasing rents and more homeless families. When rental vacancy rents rates are dropping as low as 1.4% in Community District 10, that's a housing shortage. When we see thousands of people on the waiting list for Co-op City, that's a housing shortage. When folks say that this project will bring over a thousand people into the neighborhood, that sounds like over a thousand people who need it, who aren't being represented here. We do need housing. In the last decade, Bronx Community District 10 permitted so few homes per 1,000 residents, it ranks among the bottom 10 community districts citywide. We're not doing our part. Now, I'm sure there are folks here who are happy about that, that you finally signed with the Greenberg County rezoning. But that was done nearly two decades ago. It's time to revisit it. I understand it's the position of some board members that apartments are okay if it's already allowed under the current zoning. But the number of housing being built, the amount of housing being built under the current zoning is inadequate. 
The board says it's not against affordable housing, but a report this week found that in Council District 13, only 58 affordable units were built since 2014, ranking it on the bottom five citywide. Barely any is being built. The Bruckner Boulevard rezoning is the best opportunity on the table to add much needed housing to Throckmorton. Bruckner Boulevard is a very wide corridor with access to multiple bus routes. It can and should have more density. The current zoning would not be able to the number of homes. some of the same folks were opposed to that school expansion for being too big. Writing to the Bronx Time, our school is not overcrowded. Quote, the enormous size of the expansion of PS14 is incredible considering the initial enrollment numbers at PS14 started downwards since that was written. I don't think these issues have been argued in good faith.
for 33 years. I grew up on Baltham Ave and I raised my son here. Until last year, that food town was my supermarket. 304 and MS 101 were my son's schools. My parents, my sister, my beloved neighbors own houses in the neighborhood. And when I started to save and look for a place to buy a few years ago, naturally I wanted to stay close. But it's impossible. It's even with a stable, good paying city job that I have, even with the tight saving habits that my parents instilled in me, I found it impossible to find something that was affordable. And I eventually bought in a small co-op in another Bronx neighborhood. But I'm here all the time. My son's school activities, my parents are older, so I, you know, I'm here to stay close. My best friend owns here where my nail salon is, where you know, my doctors used to be. If I had any options uh, besides renting or taking out a $750,000 loan on a mortgage, I would have. But that fiscal responsibility that my parents taught me goes both ways. And I didn't feel that I could justify that on a single income. I'm sympathetic to the concerns that I heard today. I grew up in this neighborhood, but I strongly, I strongly believe that we have to be more open to housing so that our friends, yeah. neighbors, and family can stay. This is the neighborhood I love and I was born and raised in and I couldn't stay in. It, it allows the kids that are, you know, your kids to stay in the neighborhood that they grew up in. I feel like a housing project like this is sorely needed and it's a drop in the bucket when it comes to what New York City needs. I think that uh, the project comes with great opportunities when it comes to commerce, climate change, transit. I know everybody loves their cars, my family too. Everyone's got two, three cars in a household, but I gave up mine in 2014 and I'm fine because this is a walkable, transit-rich neighborhood. I don't need a car. Um, and I think this is a neighborhood that's welcoming, supportive one, despite what you might hear or see today. And I think that folks, you know, I support that proposal because folks deserve a safe and dignified affordable home in a great neighborhood like this. Thank you so much. All right, folks, we're gonna calm down. We're gonna have the presentation now from, uh, from Ackerman and, uh, and Bronx Lake Associates. Uh, I've got uh, Jackie Skrinski and, and James Cervini. We're giving them seven minutes, seven to 10 minutes of the presentation. And again, Jackie, James, address the board, not the public. So this is the first step. We, we appreciated the feedback that we received at the Land Use Committee, and obviously now further feedback at, at the full board meeting. And you know, as, as the project continues, uh, we, will, we will continue to get feedback from the public. So it's appreciated. Uh, and now I will turn it over to James Servino, who will, will um, speak to you about the project's benefit. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking this meeting, giving us the opportunity to present this development project. Um, 20 years ago, I was a school teacher, high school, lived, born, raised right over the bridge in College Point. I was raised above a deli and know what it's like to be a working man and needing affordable housing. So I think it's really important to note that this is not, not just a development for the community. We, 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 need, we need homes, we need housing, we need rental apartments, affordability for nurses, police, firemen, sanitation. The average blue collar worker cannot afford a million dollar home or $750,000 condominium. We really need to 
supply this community with rental space for our children, for people that are starting up yeah, your children. In, in this area. This at least we're, we're, we're saying we want to, we didn't come in from the back door here. We wanted to come in with the community board, with the local, elect, the local the elected politicians. We wanted to meet with them and say, what can we do? So in the last few years, we've been helping the food insecure, getting involved with the food, food pantry. I run a food pantry in Queens. I, I run a food pantry and support a food pantry over here. We want to create space for the, the a non nonprofit group we want to build on site B, we want to put a education center. Right now, I'm renting at a loss to a baseball batting cage for youth. We want to do that. We want to be part of this community. We're not in it to make a big, fast buck. We want to support the needs, the needs and the insecurity, the needs and the insecurity. Don't we want College Point, Queens? Don't we want to? 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 Don't we Got it. So it's very important to note that going against this development, you're going against veterans care, veterans housing, veterans housing, school teachers, police, fire departments. One in four homeless are veterans in New York City. We we really need to accommodate the elderly, affordable care. This is not, we're not doing a needle exchange program here. We're not doing a homeless shelter here. We're not starting an Antifa rally. We are bringing food, quality food to the neighborhood. Education center, police, firemen, veterans. We are gonna be creating housing. Where's the focus now? Yes. It's okay. You're not looking good, you're gonna be all night. Be quiet. Getting back to the percentages of homes, rental apartments that we're going to accommodate. Jackie will get into the statistics and the numbers per development property. Next slide. The average income, again, I want to reiterate, no homeless shelter, no Antifa rallies. We're not going to be doing any of these things that people have been calling me, making threats. People have been protesting a local food market here, saying that to boycott where you get your food. That is bizarre. The average income per person, per couple, is approximately $140,000. There's no Section 8s going on here. Next slide. Next slide. The other important thing that I want to conclude with is that the community needs access to quality food. We need to expand this. Next slide. The reason why is by entering into the fresh fruit and vegetable program in New York City, we're gonna be making affordable food for our local schools. So when you say, are we giving back? We are giving back. We're gonna be putting a nonprofit here. We're gonna be creating a food pantry here. We're gonna be in developing in environmental programs, education center, youth sports. But the most important thing, you wanna talk about giving back in terms of infrastructure into our schools, we need to make food, quality food, more available to our students in the local schools here. And by getting into this program, we need to expand, we need to make a bigger supermarket. To support and afford something like this, we really need to expand. Next one. If we don't 
get this up zone to open up a, a, a massive supermarket here that would create quality foods for our local, for the locals in this community and the schools. It's going to be a devastating loss. I want to conclude by saying that I'm calling out our elected politicians, just like you are. I have the right to call out my elected politicians that if you're against this development, you're against affordable housing for nurses, cops, veterans, firefighters. Yeah, and that's the bottom line. We here, this development is going to give affordable housing to these essential workers. And that's how I want to conclude. I just want to tell and stop the misconceptions of homeless shelters, needle exchange programs. We're going to be supplying affordable housing for our essential workers. Thank you very much. All those people own homes right now. So I, I know many of you were at the Land Use Committee meeting, but I do just want to remind you of what the, the application is here this evening. Um, so the proposed development will be four sites. Uh, also, just to, to clarify, the rezoning only covers four block fronts on Bruckner Boulevard. Uh, our commercial thoroughfare, as you know, through this area of Drogna. It is just north of the Drogna bid. Um, it is an area that is in need of mixed use development and a commercial corridor. There will be a commercial overlay mapped, uh, which is a zoning overlay that permits mixed use development over all of the sites so that it will create this continuity and, and spur new economic development as well as create housing opportunities that would not be permitted right now. As part of um, the rezoning, I also want to just remind that these sites were not down zones. It, the, on Bruckner Boulevard, the sites were R4, and they were contextualized with the Throgsnap rezoning. This will allow for a modest increase in density to an R6A, um, which allows for the four sites to be redeveloped. It will be two eight-story buildings, one five-story building, and one three-story building. As you heard, overall, it's 339 dwelling units. But when you look at each of the four sites, which will be developed over time, it starts site A is 139 dwelling units with 41 mandatory permanently affordable housing units. Site B will be 114 units with 34 permanently affordable units. Site C will be 64 units with 19 affordable, affordable units. And site D will be 22 units. That's the three-story building. As James stated, it will be 15 veterans apartments across sites A, B, and C. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, next slide. Okay, just to explain what the mandatory inclusionary housing program is, this is the zoning action where all, all the sites will be mapped with this tax amendment. So some of you were saying, oh, you're promising affordable housing. This requires that if new residential development is built here, there will be 30% of the residential floor area that will be permanently affordable. And as you can see from the incomes, they, they range from 66,880 for a studio, to 85920 for a two-bedroom apartment. I know for me, coming out of law school, it's definitely something I would qualify for. Um, just moving to the next slide. Um, so I was speaking about the distinct locations. I don't want to waste too much of your time, but it, these are the sites just north of the Throgs Neck Bid. Um, moving to the next slide. Next slide. This is site D, further along the Bruckner Boulevard. Next slide. Um, this is the supermarket site that you all know. Uh, the supermarket will close without the rezoning. Just next slide. That's okay. Um, okay, you can, I think you can go through the next. And, and then site C and site D are, are vacant. They've been vacant historically. There's, there's nothing on them. Um, they can be redeveloped with really nice new developments here. Uh, next slide. Just to bring, you know, you've heard that the affordable housing crisis affects all of New York City, but to bring it very locally, um, Community District 10 has 
called out in their statement of needs the aging and unmaintained housing stock here, and there is a 1.4% vacancy rate. It's ex extremely low. So there is a need for new housing. Additionally, this uh, community board 10 has the second highest population of age 65 and over living in poverty. So there's even more of a need for senior housing in this community. And there's a need for new housing. If the zoning remains the same, no new housing will be built. And there's a need for it. Um, we just moving to the next, food security and economic development. We're also called out the the new retail and facility will create new jobs, and it will also keep the supermarket jobs, which is about 80 jobs right now that that are for local Throgs Neck community members. Moving to the next slide. Um, so the land use actions that are requested for the board to vote on this evening are zoning map amendments from the R4-1 and R4-A districts to an R6-A uh, C C24 commercial overlay along sites A, B, and C block fronts, and then also um, to an R5-B for site D, which is the smaller lot along uh, the Bruckner Expressway. And also the zoning tax amendment to map mandatory inclusionary housing, and also the D mapping. Go ahead, moving to the next slide. Just to give you the rendering. This is the site where the supermarket will be located and, and new housing. 60,000 residents per month use this supermarket. 60,000 residents. Right Site B, uh, this will be a five-story mixed-use development where the ground floor will be community facility space. Uh, James mentioned there's currently the batting cages there now, but it's intended to be repurposed as community facility and recreation space for youth. And Site C will provide new, uh, much-needed professional office space as well as uh, housing. And Site D will be 22 units of, of residential housing. Just to remind everyone, as part of the environmental, uh, as part of the land use application and environmental review was completed, we heard your concerns about infrastructure. Um, there, that is part of the environmental review, and any like any significant adverse impacts would require further study. This site did not trigger. Um, any significant adverse impacts on the environment here. Additionally, all the sites will be required, I know there was concerns about sewers and sanitary, there will be required to have site connection proposals, which requires that there be no significant impacts on, on current infrastructure. Uh, so all of the new developments will have to comply with very stringent um, stormwater requirements and sanitary sewer hookup requirements. And um, if, if there are any questions, we can't answer no questions, sorry. But um, thank you for your time and we appreciate it. All right, folks, we're going to continue that public participation. I'll remind everyone what it's about. 807. So, I know we got about 11 speakers left, but uh, everyone gets three minutes, but if you can speed it up, we we'll all appreciate it. The next one up is uh, Luke. Is that the donors? No. Close enough. All right. After Luke is uh, Andy Mickle uh, Mickle and then Joseph Name. Hi, good evening. My name is Luke Zavados. I live in the Bronx and I urge the board members tonight to support the uh, construction of housing with this project. I am somebody who is uh, personally affected with friends and family who have to down. move out of their apartments. Their landlords are raising the rents astronomically and 
One of the not things me. that we can do to combat the lack of housing and the rental oh, burden that uh, working class uh, New Yorkers share is by constructing new places so that we can alleviate some of that need. Um, I know there's a lot of opposition here tonight, uh, and but I really urge you to uh, to vote in support of this. I think in about three years, this will all be water under the bridge. Um, so this Thank you for having me here. My name is Andrew McCollinez. I live at 1230 Kearney Avenue. Kearney Avenue. I hope that you guys do not go with this. I've lived here since 1969. My parents moved here. This has always been a wow. family, working family area. This area, my, my granddaughter goes to PS14. She can't go to an after school center because they have to ship her to 72 because they don't have enough room for them. There was a lottery, a lottery, a lot of kids out. Now, I had from Ida over four feet of water in my basement from the sewers coming up. Every single one of my neighbors had water coming up in the basement. One neighbor on Ellsworth completely to the roof of their house. There's no way you're gonna tell me that adding 190, 300 and so on, the sewer systems can't take it. It's impossible. So I would greatly discourage this. Parking, if you ever see going on PS14 over here, it's triple parked over there. You can't get through. The fire department, buses, cars, anyone getting over there between two and four o'clock, forget about it. Every single, this, if you ever go down on Tremont Avenue, Tremont Avenue is always full. What are we gonna do with the uh, highway over here? Once they start building uh, the overpass, I noticed that it's rusting, and I see that that from painting wall doesn't look all that happy either. So I believe that there's gonna be a lot more problems, and they're not gonna fix it. The city's gonna end up having our taxes. That's right. That's right. We're gonna this project or the additional overdevelopment which will eventually follow it. And the probability of that additional overdevelopment was already conceded to by the lady from Ackerman LLP at the St. Benedict's meeting. Okay? All the problems we currently endure are lack of parking, traffic congestion, overcrowded schools and hospitals, litter streets, slow police response time, excessive noise, power outages, sewer problems. They're all going to increase many times over. Besides the applicant control proposed buildings, now those are bad enough in and of themselves. There are approximately 30 other parcels of land within the project area that will be scoped subject to development if this application isn't denied. Secondly, and just as importantly, many of us settled here specifically because of the low density nature of this community. It would be unfair for us to be the product of these hard fought for protections solely in order to enrich a handful of developers. Thirdly, developments of this nature always bear the risk of morphing into something vastly different than what is pitched. The Pelham Grand went from proposed veteran senior housing to support housing for AIDS sufferers, many of whom have proven to be substance abusers, unstable, disruptive, and destructive. 2,800 Bruckner's plans changed from a proposed holistic wellness center to a substance abuse treatment facility directly across the street from a preschool for disabled children. Thank God we, we got that one killed. Uh, and I'm very confident the board will reject this disastrous proposal, which benefits no one other than these particular developers. And I'm hopeful that our council member who possesses 
district will choose her constituents over developers, paid lobbyists, and de facto lobbyists such as Open New York City. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Frank Verduccio. After Frank, I've got uh, Scott, Scott Barnard and then Will Thomas. Thanks a lot. The ultimate question we all have is what will our neighborhood be like if this development is accomplished? Fortunately, history provides a clue. Throughout the city of New York, developments like this have gone on to middle class neighborhoods just like ours. The end result is the destruction of that neighborhood. Like many of you, I took $20,000 worth of damage in my home from the last flood. There's no way they're going to build new sewers and water lines. We will be destroyed. Now, I live on Fairmont Avenue. Unlike a lot of the people who testified in favor of this project, I actually live here. We were told at the outset of our testimony that we're not supposed to bring politics into this. Everyone speaking in favor of this ridiculous project talked about climate change, housing crisis around the world, world poverty. We are here, and your job as a community board is to protect this neighborhood. This project goes in, our community is destroyed. It's your job to save it. and then Carol DiCiera. Hi, I respectfully ask everybody on this board here to vote no. I live two blocks down from this proposed project. Um, infrastructure is bad. I was three feet away. This to happen to anybody else. Again, in the morning, this, uh, the traffic is unbelievable. Uh, if you're going to have people pulling out of a building on Crosby Avenue. It's just unbelievable. I mean, I can't get up there half the time myself now between people parking cars from school. Uh, I would hate to see something happen to like an emergency vehicle or something like that. I don't believe that this is proper and I'm against it. Thank you. Thomas, and then Carol DiCiara, and then uh, Denise is out. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is William Thomas, uh, and I serve as the executive director of Open New York. I'm here to testify. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm here to testify today in support of the rezoning of Bruckner Boulevard. Open New York is an independent, grassroots, pro-housing nonprofit. Mason, Delaware. We support the rezoning because there is a dire need for more housing in the neighborhood and New York City as a whole, which the 339 homes proposed here will help to address. I believe on some level, everyone knows New York has a terrible housing shortage. But let me add some context to this conversation. Right now, New Yorkers are facing rent increases up to 50, 60, 70 percent as rent discounts offered during the pandemic expire. Homelessness is at the highest rate since the Great Depression. There are over 14,000 children who sleep in city shelters each night. The 94 affordable homes this rezoning would provide are desperately needed, especially in a council district that has only seen 54 such units built since 2014. But I should also emphasize that this neighborhood plainly needs more housing. Out of all the community boards in the city, Bronx Community Board, com Bronx community board 10 comes in 43rd in terms of new housing permitted per capita. In other words, when it comes to new construction, Community Board 10 might not be dead last, but it's in the bottom 10 out of 51. This may not be a problem for long Where do you live? That's it! This, this may not be a problem for longtime homeowners. After all, they already own their home. But for anyone looking to find a new place in the neighborhood, whether you're 
Whether you're a newly married couple looking to buy a place or a senior looking to downsize to an accessible home with an elevator, the lack, the lack of new construction is devastating. I want to address some opponents' quality of life concerns and emphasize that this project is a clear improvement this project is a clear improvement on the status quo, replacing vacant land, a batting cage, and a grocery store with another grocery store. It will actively help local businesses while providing them with more customers. At the end of the day, we are talking about an apartment building. It will, it, it, an apartment building. It will hardly overwhelm or destroy a neighborhood. To put it plainly, we live in a city where there aren't enough homes for the people who want to live here, which has horrifying human consequences. That is the terrible shadow over the neighborhood, the quality of life issue to address. I hope the community board can consider that and ultimately support some version of the project. Thank you. All right, folks, folks. Folks, we got a parking situation. Will the owner of the... Folks! Will the owner of a, of a Sienna, Toyota Sienna license plate? DFG 2803, please move your car. You're blocking someone in. DFJ, I'm sorry, DFJ 2803. Who's got a Toyota Sienna? Guys, don't worry about where people live, okay? Everyone's got a right to their opinion, everybody's here for a reason. Carol Di Chiara. After Carol, Denise, Denise Lucky, and then Marion Diaz. Hello, board. Thank you all for being here. Guys, guys, don't make, don't make us look bad. I'd like to address what they have said tonight, here tonight, and that that's the only thing we really should address because we all know how we feel, right? So out of um, the, the apartment buildings that, or the apartments that they plan on, 94 would be affordable. That, that's highly, that's really low if you want to put affordable housing. The other thing is that there's 15 veterans 15, what is 15 apartments gonna do? For our veterans, that's nothing. There's nothing is senior housing. I didn't see a number for senior housing. Where, how many, two, one, none, 10? I'd like to know, There's, it's not answered. The other thing that I'd like to say is that, you know, a eight story building is out of place in this neighborhood. It's completely out of place. It does not go with our community. Now the other thing that I'd like to say is that the vacant land has been there for years. Years, we have lived with an eyesore for years and now the developers, because they've gotten together, they want to take advantage of the situation. Why would we let these developers get rich and we've had to look at it for all these years? Why? The other thing is, um, that I'd like to say is, we are middle class. And there's nothing wrong with being middle class. And there's nothing wrong with wanting a single family home or a multi-family home. There's nothing wrong with low dense communities. Some people like and have moved here because it's a low dense community. So there's nothing wrong with our community. Hey, don't let anybody tell you that we are, uh, we need anything else than what we have because we've moved here because of it. Thank you. And to Denise Marie Diaz. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Denise Zeckley. I'm a resident of the Waterbury LaSalle neighborhood. I've spent my career in public service to the people of New York City. I grew up in this neighborhood, and after living in other parts of the city for 11 years, I moved back here to raise my family. The neighborhood surrounding the proposed rezoning is served by one public and one parochial school both of which have been struggling, especially in the wake of the pandemic. PS14, which recently underwent an expansion, did so in order to accommodate the influx of students who enrolled when District 8 schools were rezoned to help lessen the overcrowding at PS71. St. Benedict's, 
recently received an influx of students pushing class sizes to the limits when nearby OLA closed due to the height of the pandemic. Allowing the proposed upzoning would increase class sizes even more, putting a further strain on our classrooms and on our children who are already struggling to make up for learning gaps that they suffered during the pandemic. Rezoning to allow hundreds of residential units would exponentially increase traffic slowdowns, would make parking near impossible. Beyond that, the disruption to vehicle and pedestrian traffic that the construction of these sites currently proposed would bring would make our daily commutes to school and work even more difficult and potentially dangerous. I'm a public transit commuter. I've been one for more than 20 years. I can also say that the proposed upzoning would put a further strain on our already struggling bus and subway routes. If you look at the proposal, it tells you that from Berkner and Logan, it's six minutes to Middletown Road. No. It's not. Yeah. I walk to Middletown Road every day from near Waterbury Park, it takes at least eight minutes if I'm hustling. To get there from the proposed sites, you need to take the 40, the 42, or the 8 bus. And good luck with that. If you can get on the bus, I see that my time is running short, so I'm going to skip to the end of my We cannot fall prey to the false narrative that these developers are looking out for the community because they are including affordable housing as a portion of their proposed residential buildings. Their proposal includes mandatory inclusionary housing because it is mandatory. <laughs> if they want to apply for rezoning for a project to build anything that includes more than 10 units, they're required to include a percentage of units below market value. This is not a bad requirement. But no one should be fooled into thinking that the developers have put forth this proposal because of their philanthropic beliefs. <laughs> they want to the vote so that they can build more units that will add to their rental incomes and bring them further profit. If they truly want to provide the much needed affordable housing for our community, let them do it within the current zoning laws. Yes. <laughs> Good evening to the board. Thank you for this opportunity to address this matter. My name is Maria, and unlike the people who are voting yes on this project, I am a member of this community. And I vote no, an unequivocal, absolute no to changing our current zoning laws. To my pockets of developers, I vote no to adding children to an already burdened school system that cannot currently properly service the children in our community. I have a neighbor who has to pay for her child to go to private school outside of her neighborhood, not out of choice, but out of need, because her child cannot get a seat at the zoning school despite the fact that she pays property taxes and that includes the right for her to child to learn in this neighborhood. I vote no to the overtaxing of our 45th precinct and putting my community at a higher risk of not getting the attention it needs during a time when they may need it the most. I vote no to adding an unfair burden to our FDNY, putting my neighbors, their homes, and our businesses at risk of not getting the attention they deserve during a potential loss of everything they worked for to build and losing and risk of losing lives. I vote no to adding burdens to our hospitals, increasing hours of wait for my neighbors and my family, especially during a pandemic. I vote no to increase property taxes and decrease property values. I vote no to decrease parking spaces and increase traffic patterns. I do vote yes. Yes to building housing within our current zoning laws. And I invite the builders and any member of Open New York to give back to our community that has been supportive to them. They can use their extra funds to solve the real problems in our community, yeah. our lacking of infrastructure, and help people, help strengthen our school system, strengthen our hospitals, increase our precincts, and our F support its community, and vote no as well. Thank you. Thank you.
John Cortezzi. All right, he just left. All right, Bob Wolfel. Bob Wolfel. After Bob, I've got Kevin Pietro. Pietro. P i e t r o w, and then Joe Brogan. Bob. Okay, so I get three minutes. Yeah, I'll give you three. Um, I would like to address the board, but I don't like turning my back on it's okay. anybody here. So, because we're all in this together. All right. I was going to go in a different direction, but everybody has basically said that. So I wrote a few comments down, uh, just to just to make a, a an observation. Okay. First of all, everything has been said already, so I'm not going to repeat it and keep everybody here forever. Congestion, lack of parking, school overcrowding, FDNY, and police problems, etc. I have lived here. I have lived here for 78 years. Okay, I have lived here for 78 years. I love this place, except for the $93,000 worth of damage I had from the recent flood because the sewers here can't handle them. Okay, all right. All right. All right. All right. I would simply like to address on a different thing that hasn't been addressed. And it's the character of these people. And the reason that I'm trying to push this through, okay. One of the problems I had was that, I never thought of it, but they had mentioned the democratic process. I have been putting signs around the neighborhood and they have been torn down. They have been torn down. I confronted the person who was tearing them down and I said, what are you doing that for? What are you doing that for? And he said, you're littering. So I took a video of him. I have the video of it, and I'm saying, this is not a democratic process. I don't mind giving an argument, and I don't mind listening to his argument, but it should be democratic. So I think that was almost ironic that this, that was said in the beginning. Okay, I will end here. Listen, we all know what this is about. It is not providing, it is not about providing more housing. It is not about sports for the kids. It is not about better food. It's all about money for people that don't even live here. Kevin Pietro. Kevin. All right, Joe Brogan. <coughs> After Joe, I've got Joseph. Uh, Yeah. Is that right? Okay. No problem. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes. Good evening, community board. I am not um, screaming at you. I just want everyone to hear me. My name is Joe Brogan. I live in the community. I have lived in the community my entire life. I want to just speak quickly about public safety and quality of life. Before I do, please take notes down. Miss Mooney, I think it was, and I was approached myself by a gentleman um, who showed me paperwork. If this is true, and I believe it to be true, I saw even Mayor Adams sign on to it. The FAA made trump all of this. The, an eight-story building in this zone is in direct violation of federal law. The primary <laughs> the primary runway at LaGuardia Airport. Please write this down. It's number 22. Look up FAA LaGuardia Airport 22. You cannot build um, what the proposals are. It exceeds the height. It can't be done. So this proposal shouldn't go forward just based on that. It should make it move. Let me just please move on <coughs> after that. Um, everyone knows now, currently, the Bruckner Interchange is the most congested section or corridor of road in New York City. I hope the community board is aware that Bronx County is the leading county, not just in New York City, New York State, the entire United States 
in the highest asthma rates, right. as well as significant other respiratory illnesses. Now, I just want to end, it's been said before, but it must be emphasized. There's no way the 45th Precinct, our Engine 89, um, there's no way they are already working way below what they could work with. They need, be, need more resources. This project cannot go forward unless we have guarantees of additional policing, additional, they only got 40 seconds left, additional, the, the fire department, the hospitals need more beds. None of this has been addressed. Sanitation. Everyone knows our sewer system is deficient, to say the least. Our water system. No one spoke about our water system, our water pressure. No one spoke. No one, I'm sorry. It's not being addressed by the applicants. All right? That's what I mean. And um, the schooling. Everyone knows about PS71, PS14, PS72, the overcrowding. We have no additional buses, no additional subways, no additional roading. All right, so uh, I have to end it here. I have a lot more to say, but let's uh, thank you. And Engineers, okay. And what the gentleman before me just said is correct. And uh, there is a federal mandate. This is the law, in case you're interested in it. You guys need to check this out, okay? Stating that Brodsnick is in the flight obstruction zone of LaGuardia Airport. This is it right here, okay? Inside that flight obstruction area, okay? Where you see that triangle, you can't build anything for what they're proposing. And now, before you make a decision, okay, and, uh, and, and to get a handle on to whether or not they're complying with this is a federal regulation which supersedes, okay? The second thing I want to say is that uh, this whole project here, in my opinion as an inspector, is a facade. Because what's gonna happen is that after they build this, they are gonna invoke as of right zoning, which is gonna allow them to manipulate the zoning regulations and build anything that they wanna build. And in a couple of years, Drog's Neck is gonna just be another concrete jungle. Thank you. Jenny Toledo, then uh, John O'Leary. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jenny Toledo, and unlike many of our residents, I haven't lived here that long. But I can tell you that I moved here from high-density communities. I lived in Highbridge. I lived on the Grand Concourse, I lived on Parchester, and I lived in the South Bronx. And I also know Queens very well, and those that heard of Long Island City, and know all the overdevelopment that they contributed right. in that community by these developers by is a disaster. And I'll tell you why. They keep throwing housing and affordable. It's a lie. It's a total lie. And the only affordable is affordable to their pockets, not to our community and not to us. 
Let me give you some right stats because Open New York deleted me from their account because I threw some stats at them. And let me tell you out of Twitter. Let me tell you, currently in PS304, there's 403 students waiting to get into kindergarten. 483 kids that live in this community and cannot get into kindergarten. Where is the shortage? There's no shortage of housing. We have in 10465, there are over 250 rental apartments vacant. To housing development, a total of 2680, 2,600 of affordable housing. And what I mean affordable, it's not market, it's based on your income. 20% of your income, you're allowed to live there, that's affordable, not market value. In addition to that, when, you, when they mention Co-op City and there's a wait list, you know why there's a wait list? Because they have repairs to be made. That's the wait list. There's no wait list in Co-op City. And let me tell you what we need in our community, okay? We need, this is what we need, an affordable supermarket. Because yeah. I don't shop in food. Yeah. I don't yeah. shop in food. Market that provides food to Hispanics, Blacks, Asians, right all denominations where Food Town does not provide. Okay, let me need, let me tell you what else we need to do: expand our schools, expand our hospitals. Okay, add additional transportation. Another it takes us an hour from Westchester Square, waiting for a bus to take me all the way to Lafayette Avenue. Yeah. These are our issues. We live here and we <laughs> breathe it every day. Okay? Don't be fooled by the narrative. Yeah. Hi, my name is John O'Leary. I'm a retired local three electrician and a business owner in this neighborhood for 30 years. It's not about color. I taught blacks, Chinese, yellow, almond, blue, karate for years. If they couldn't afford it, I taught them for free. It's not about affording nothing. I couldn't afford it. You know what? I worked for my house. I put three kids through Catholic school and college, broke my ass, worked overtime, sometimes seven days a week. Nobody gave me nothing. And for you, Food Town, shame on you because we supported you for years and years and years. And you turned your back on us. Uh, but all I'm saying is you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. And we are not fooled. And if you vote for this, this is on you. And also, I live in the middle of, I live maybe in the middle of the block of Food Town. Eight o'clock in the morning, honk, honk, honk. You can't even get triple park cars. Plus, the ambulance can't get by, buses can't get by, and the garbage in my house that I gotta pick up everything that I've never seen before. It's a shame. Don't vote for this crap. I read Vanilla, I'm last speaker for the night. Kevin Pietros, Kevin here? Kevin? John spoke at the last week. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. As a former board member, I know where you stand on this, and I know that your belief is our community is special. It's special because of all the work that we put into it, all the sweat, protesting, standing up, fighting against all the developers from 2002 to now. It is not that we are against development, because let's remember the TPs that were on Middletown Road, they're gone, right? And there's two family homes there, which was within the zoning. So anything within the zoning, we're not gonna fight it. Outside of the zoning, we can't. We don't have the infrastructure. I am grateful that when my son was at PS71, the year that he was graduating from eighth grade, I know you guys know that's difficult for me. So when he was graduating from eighth grade, 
I didn't know if I was going to be able to keep him in the community. And everybody knows that, especially here. But then PS 71 created the annex, and they allowed him to stay there until he was going to high school, which meant that I could walk into school and that if he spilled something on his parents, I could get there quickly. So I feel for all the parents that cannot take their child to school and walk them and be available to them because those are the precious years. You cannot lose that here. I moved here because of the community, because of every time I drove around. And yes, I'm in real estate and development is important, but stick within the zoning. As our last speaker of participation, I have a motion to close public participation. Motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right, we're going to move to a vote now. We'll go on the, over the, the So this is the resolution. This resolution was passed by the Housing and Zoning Committee last Tuesday. By 13 members on the Housing and Zoning Committee, 11 voted in favor. One recused himself and one was absent. The resolution reads, Resolved that the recommendation of the Housing and Zoning Committee, the committee draft a letter of disapproval to the City of New York City Planning Commission on the matter of uniform land use review procedure application C220007ZMX and that this be forwarded to the full board for its approval. So again, if you are in favor of the resolution, you're, where you're telling us to draft a letter of disapproval. Every member understand that? Okay, do I have a motion? Do I have a second? Second. Okay, on the proposal, any questions from the board? Okay, Matt, do a roll call vote. <coughs> Thomas Accomando. Yes. <coughs> Raquel Baez. Yes to disapprove. Folks, I'll say it again. The resolution is to draft a letter of disapproval to the city of New York. So if you vote in favor of the resolution, we're going to draft a letter of disapproval. If our members vote against the resolution, we're voting a letter of approval. Okay? Bob Reeder. Yes. Milagros Tufano. Yes. Peter Cantillo. Maria Caruso. Yes. Andrew Sirico. Yes. Peter Del Debio. Yes. Terrence Franklin. Yes. George Habernet. Yes. Deborah Hunt. Yes. Dorothy Kronicki. Yes. Malone Lychee. John Morano. Yes. Susan McMillan. Yes. Joseph Mondello. Yes. Martin Morris. Yes. Mary Jane Musano. Yes. Lupopovic, conflict? Uh, thank you. John Robert. Yes. Nancy Rosario. Yes. Mr. Chair. Yes. Tony Salambeni. My neighbors, yes. Tom Smith. Yes. Janine Thomas. That's it. Our motion carries. Motion to close the public hearing. All in favor? Okay. The public hearing is closed. We're going to wait about five minutes, and then we're going to start our fifth board meeting. The matter is closed. The matter is going to be going after the city.